Hi, I'm Len, and this is a college textbook on critical thinking. Something that is supposed to help you improve your thoughts and words and win arguments. It has a cool snowboarder on the cover, kind of like Boy's Life magazine. Nevertheless, it was interesting enough that I grabbed it off the shelf. It covers a lot of bases. I can definitely say I learned something from it. How many intellectuals have met someone who is less educated than you are, who suddenly says something brilliant or gives a better solution than you would give, someone who, by the premise of this book, shouldn't be brilliant, that fascinates you because you know it didn't come from critical thinking, or at least not your kind of thinking? It's like meeting someone who is not as successful as you, but is happier than you are. Something that makes your advantages meaningless. This video will give examples of non-traditional thinking, from anti-academic to anarchists, to religious zealots, to non-aligned institutions, to prove that there are things outside of formulaic thinking that are a mystery to logical or disciplined thinkers and therefore they don't really have the keys to omnipotence. In education it's non-academic students, teachers, and writings. In science it's scientific experts who take the side of religion in physical fitness, it's fitness experts who are attracted to overweight women. So these are not things that are just eccentric, but fly in the face of an institution's beliefs. And yet people are intrigued by them. And the more people are told there is a single path, a single way to be, the more intrigued they are by it. Basically, this is a self-replicating guide to academic thinking. And you could say, I'm a scholar for the other side examining it. There's an expression that's sometimes referred to as Clark's fourth law. For every expert, there is an equal and opposite expert. I'm going to demonstrate this using this text. Chapter 1 starts with, This book is about the power of disciplined thinking. It's about learning to think for yourself and being your own person. It will help you develop the skills and dispositions you need to become a self-directed thinker and learner. This kind of statement is a portmanteau of two different things. Self-motivated people can do the opposite of what you want them to do, and yet promoters use terms like self-directed to get people to do the specific things they want. As in, why don't you agree with me? Can't you think for yourself? Every page of this book is loaded with personal opinions, forcing the learner to choose between disagreement or mastering their skills as an arguer. How many of you have had parents, teachers, or employers who can't accept that someone disagrees with them because they find it ego bruising? So they try to control the process. Let's look at the phrase disciplined thinking. Let's say I don't believe in discipline and my hero is author Pat Conroy, who was raised in an abusive household, then spent a year teaching underprivileged kids in a one-room schoolhouse on an island in South Carolina, during which he refused to use corporal punishment and 
was fired after one year, which is the basis of the book The Water is Wide. A situation in which an undisciplined person is thinking for himself and being his own person against a sea of disciplinarians. The next paragraph starts, critical thinking is what a college education is all about. This is a Sarah Sanders type statement or tell people what to believe. Colleges don't like criticism, which raises the intellectual flag. How can you teach philosophy in school? What keeps the students from questioning their own institution and marching out? How do you explain philosophically the need to pass a test or the professor's need for a paycheck without running into it's just the way things are? I'd like to note that a textbook is not a school. A school is sort of a castle on a hill that makes decisions in its own self-interest. This book makes several jabs at different aspects of the school system. The first chapter lays out the tenets of clarity, precision, relevance, consistency, and others. Now, these are all good things to have. The trouble is, people only care about whether you agree with them or not. Here are some classic examples. Under logical correctness, it says, to think logically is to reason correctly. So how do you debate someone who is smarter or has more facts than you do? Some people will say, if you're arguing with someone who knows more than you do, you need to get more facts. You need to make your argument better. This is a ploy. Many critical thinkers have lost arguments to people who were not as gifted as them. When someone has a particular strength, you need a different strength or you will forever be on the defensive. There will always be someone who knows more than you. Someone isn't going to tell you how to beat them. That's something they keep to themselves. People memorize information to their specific advantage to make this unlikely for you. And some of them have become so formulaic in their responses, there is nothing you can say that will get a different one. But what they don't understand is there is more than just memorizing and repeating facts, thinking this is an easy path with no conceivable weakness, and that itself is a weakness. The way to counter someone who follows all these rules is to do the opposite. Fight fire with water. Don't wear your knowledge on your sleeve. Resist the urge to show your hand. Listen to this. Critical thinkers have a passion for timely, accurate information. Consumers, citizens, workers, and parents strive to make decisions that are as informed as possible. These are people the writer considers upstanding. It's the argument good people do these things. So what if the critical thinker is an anarchist or a student who is not favored by adults but has his own purposes? A person's situation doesn't predetermine who they are. If you want to prove that critical thinking is objective, then reverse the situation. There was a time when my field of conservation was focused only on species like eagles and tigers and giraffes, um, animals that are considered noble, animals that are parasites, which make up 
80% of the animal kingdom were considered unwanted. Next example. There are situations where the person who is at an intellectual disadvantage needs to win. If convincing people depends on how skilled you are, what would you do if you had to debate someone who is mentally retarded? Would you just mop the floor with them because you can? This book says it's all a question of skills. Many books and videos warn us against the perils of anger issues. People who get angry are bad. Verbal violence isn't the answer. But there are entire families of people who maintain a veneer of civility at the expense of whoever they choose to demonize. You almost never see anyone criticize the volume of someone who agrees with them. When someone plays this card, it's to distract from the actual subject of disagreement, probably because they have something to gain from it. Now, it's true what they say that when you forgive people, you're the one who benefits from it. That doesn't mean forfeiting the right to tell someone no. And I feel badly for people who fall into this trap just for having emotions. Question. If you were kind and gentle toward the person who is making this anger argument, would it get a different result from them? Second question. If someone learns from experience that raising their voice is the only way to get people to listen, does it say more about them or the audience? Example number four. Theology is a way that some people with no formal education at all are able to think on multiple levels and have complex discussions about their own existence. In debates over the existence of God, the critical thinker is expected to be the atheist, while the stereotypical believer is expected to be wearing overalls or something. But people don't ask, what is it that gives this person the confidence to debate an expert? And the answer is, they believe there is a greater wisdom than their own thoughts, which is an omnipotence empirical science doesn't have. Um, they don't look at today's science through the same lens that they judge the past. Uh, they only know what's right in front of them. This book gives the following conversation. How do you know God wrote the Bible? Because it says so, and what the Bible says is true. How do you know what the Bible says is true? Because God wrote it. This is meant to be an example of circuitous logic, but actually is a very real concept, that a premise and a conclusion can be the same if the source is omnipotent. Premises and conclusions are just human constructs, one person's circuitous logic is another person's self-evidence because what one person values, another person thinks is rubbish. Omnipotence is seen as some vague, non-serious concept. Take, for example, the hospital that has a pet cat that knows which patients are going to die next. The cat is just processing a different kind of information. But in our culture, medical devices are respected. The cat's sense of smell is just some quirky thing animals do. Example number five. Greater institutions are not more prone to discover facts than lesser institutions. A fact doesn't care who discovers it. 
which could be a great equalizer that puts an amateur scientist on the same level as the great ones. But unfortunately, the concept of accreditation is a custom of the tribe we're living in. Many academics in their scrutiny choose to single out smaller schools and individuals in this very subjective system. The dwarf hominid nicknamed the Hobbit, discovered by anthropologists, was so controversial the bodies were stolen from the research lab by another lab to prove they were just modern humans with dwarfism. How primitive are we that this matters? The other day I saw someone post, I know that any school system that you apply to will be honored to have you. This year Stanford and several other universities were found guilty of taking bribes to place rich students as if they had gotten there on their merits. So how do people continue to use the validity of these institutions as the basis for everything from financial donations to qualifying as an expert to justifying student debt? Example number six. It's easy to believe in a system if you ignore whether the providers are trustworthy. If you are a student who has made sacrifices, or a professor who stands on logic, or a supporter of schools, do you read about someone exactly like you who had their trust broken and just continue to do what you're doing because it didn't happen to you? Now there's an argument that the greater system is good because it's able to deal with a few bad apples. The problem with this is we greatly underestimated the amount of corruption. Look at what investigation itself has become. There is actually an extreme intellectual backpedaling going on right now where you might be in a position of authority, but you're not able to admit when you're wrong or put your strengths aside, which is a very petty disqualifier to have. And the advice of scientists, engineers, and diplomats is ignored by their superiors, even though the purpose of these trends is to spread respect for our superiors. It's not a merit-based system. It just isn't one. Anyone who remembers high school can tell you there are privileged and underprivileged students. And I'm not talking about what kind of household you come from. Some of the most affluent ones are the ones who privilege students the least. So whenever there is any kind of news about student involvement in the school board or other issues, those are exclusively the elite students favored by adults who are speaking. Students don't get to be offended and voice their opinions on TV unless it's in a way that makes them appear to be happy servants of the program. If it were a merit-based system, there would be a way for someone who disagrees to advance, and the school system would change with the seasons. Instead of a system that has remained the same for my entire life, where detractors have no place. But like most issues, you have to find examples people will accept. Even when it's something obvious to every student, someone will tell you it isn't. That's the system we are actually using. 
in my field of conservation, there is something called taxonomy, which is the scientific naming of things. This article from the Smithsonian lists everything from Tyrannosaurus to Panty Draco, explaining how technical this is when, in fact, it's an example of scientific subjectiveness. As subjective as sending a hundred dollars through the mail to have a star named after you. The advancement of genetic testing has allowed a small number of individuals to rename almost every living thing on Earth. Frogs of the genus Reina are now Lithobates. Toads of the genus Bufo are now Anaxyrus. It's the same animal it was yesterday. What you call it says more about ourselves and our imagination than it does about the animal. But when people report their wildlife observations all over the world, they are corrected by volunteers from various institutions, some of whom cut and paste the same response hundreds of times a year to keep people in line. This is a form of intellectual winnowing because it makes people forget that facts are also trends. And yet they think they're being objective. I guarantee you that this experts defending subjectiveness is the same in every field there is from the legal system to education to environmentalism because of how primitive a society we are. This book spells out all bad arguments. Personal attacks, two wrongs make a right, appeal to pity, loaded questions, and tells you what to say. If you look at each of these, it's just as possible for someone with a good argument to give them. And that's because it's a much more complicated subject than the writer makes it to be. People respond differently when it's you making the case versus watching two other people argue. It's also a mistake to let someone tell you how to think. Omnipotently, an expert isn't really an expert. There are things that can come out of left field, and it's even possible to specialize in taking down logicians. How to defeat logicians. Let's say a company doesn't want you to default on your account, and they remind you of this over and over. In actuality, this is no sweat to them. There's a procedure that takes them just seconds. What they're afraid of is that you won't make a decision, which holds them up for 90 days or whatever. Likewise, if you're a student and the teacher says they don't want to fail you, what they don't want is for the system they're using to become meaningless, let's say by the teacher's own conscience. I've seen it go both ways. Attempts to restore order to people's thoughts and rein in discrepancies can be anything from this book to someone who wants to end juvenile delinquency using mental discipline. Let's say by a smart, well-spoken, strong-willed role model. This is not a battle between knowledge and ignorance as much as it is a contest between personal preferences. But a leader may have so many facts that people don't know their preferences. They may follow him simply because of the strength of his personality. So when you have an argument between a strong role model and an unskilled delinquent, it's not how much a person knows that decides the outcome, 
but who is in a superior position. The examples of critical thinkers this book gives, workers, parents, students, are all in unequal situations where the person in charge supersedes whoever has the most facts. In most discussions with your boss or landlord or school principal or the police, there is something they can hold over you that weakens the other person because arguing with them is pointless, making it appear that you don't have a strong argument. In reality, a critical person has just as many flaws as anyone else. When you know what that is, these situations can be reversed. Often their greatest strength will tell you what their weakness is. So you lead with that, and maybe they won't even get to their talking points. I have had conversations with experts who were so glued to a certain kind of response, I can tell them what they will say next, and they will still say it. But my argument is beyond them, because five minutes ago, they didn't know it existed. This book uses Sherlock Holmes as an example of a logical thinker. It says, what's the secret to his success? An extraordinary commitment to precision. I think a much more realistic character is Mycroft Holmes. Smart people aren't as likely to become model citizens as they are to think of other people as insects, because if you already know more than your teacher, is it more likely that you will continue to follow them or that this will affect your judgment? People of all levels of intellect can be expected to prioritize whatever is in front of them. Let's say, for example, conservation of mental energy. If you are particularly gifted, don't waste your resources. The moral antagonist. In situations where the critical thinker is not the person in authority, one has to ask why, if they are so smart, have they not advanced to the point where they speak for a majority? According to this text, the critical thinker is a law-abiding consumer, or a happy student, or an industrious worker. In reality, the difference is choices, not how enlightened you are. And if you go against what is trendy, it's harder to advance in any area of expertise. And the answer is because they care about something else. Once upon a time, I had a salaried position in one of the sciences and I was probably the only anti-academic person in the system. If someone had come up to me and said, have you ever considered continuing your education? I would have replied, how many anti-academic people do you know in this business? Is it possible I'm the highest paid one? School is not something I consider necessary in my life. I feel pity for everyone I know who is a student. In the conservation job I have now, I was asked by a student interviewer what it takes to succeed in this profession. And I said, the job I get paid to do is just a pastiche for the real job of conserving species. The teacher said this response was interesting. To me, it's just normal. When it comes to dealing with some kind of business representative, could be IRS, could be the bank or an estate lawyer, waiting for you to sign over something to allow them to proceed 
even though you don't approve of them? Something that is of singular importance to you, but is just an everyday procedure to them. I have resorted to teasing these people. I thought it was the biggest contribution I could make in their life of constant affirmation. Being a moral antagonist in any environment is like having a job with a list of rules imposed on you. There is a real contest out there. That is why any non-conforming person exists. They do what they do because it's the only way they can tell the truth, do what is right, or pure intellectual achievement. The reason I make these videos is for intellectualism. I don't have any problem with critical thinking itself. Is a critique of critical thinking itself critical thinking? Feel free to post any responses below.